What's up, everybody? Welcome to today's sit down episode. Now, the young man next to me on the couch today, I've personally known for the last 38 and a little bit years. We've spent many, many, many hours debating, arguing, bickering, fighting, crying with each other, as well as making some tough decisions and um, experiencing some losses and some sad times together. The young man next to me is the very proud presenter on the Mitmac sit down, as well as group CEO of Mitmac Motors. Welcome, Bobby Petkov. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for having me on this side of the couch. Indeed, we have had uh, some tough conversations with each other and uh, I enjoy spending time in your head. And this is very weird, but I'm excited to do this and uh, can't wait. By the way, you're quite a handsome guy. You know, looking at you with that polo shirt, with these nice uh, uh, fancy pants you've got on, some nice kicks, and they're polished. You're not too bad looking yourself. You always ask the guests, who were you at 17? But um, I'm gonna dive back before 17. I know you and your family have immigrated from uh, Bulgaria, from Eastern Europe. Can you dive into why? Um, who came first? Was it the entire family? Was it your dad first? Why was that decision made at the time? And um, tell us about life before you guys came to South Africa. You were very young from what you can remember. Let's get into that. Yeah, so grew up in uh, Bulgaria, Eastern European country. Um, early, earliest um, rather recall that I have. It's very cold. It's snowing. Uh, I have to take like two buses to get to school in the winter. So not a very pleasant um, place to be in the winter, especially when you're very small like that. Um, but a nice, nice experience. I had, uh, I had a wonderful time. Um, I was, I was fortunate enough to. Uh, to be able to herd sheep with my with my grandfather with my uncle so in the mountains looking after sheep as a shepherd and um, you know financially not um, not a great place but at the time I'm young I'm having fun you know you don't realize um, you know what's going on around in terms of um, ability and finance and and you know money is not a is not a thing that's important to you climbing the mountains and you're playing with uh, sticks and throwing rocks and you know you're having a duel um, where I realized uh, you know financially uh, you know we're not doing so well is I went to school in the city and uh, you know the city the city kids lived a little bit differently but oh, it's okay I enjoyed the mountains I enjoyed the village it was a different type of upbringing but um, yeah, lots of fun. I, I really, really uh, keep that memory very fond and, uh, you know, good, good values and principles from uncles and, and from grandmother, grandfathers uh, on both sides, both mom and dad. And uh, dad left the country. He said, you know, I'm going to look for a better life and better opportunities for my kids and for my family. And uh, yeah, I had a jaw. It was hard without dad, um, you know, father figure for two and a half years. So, but I had plenty of cousins, uncles, you know, like, like uh, I love that movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, because we've got family for days. It's just cousins and uncles, first, second, third. So, you know, there was enough help. There was enough um, good support um, around us. Can you maybe dive into the conversations or some of the times that you and your dad have spoken around why a decision was made um, to obviously immigrate? What was that, what was that driving force behind him deciding to abandon the family there, immigrate for a better future. Why was that decision made? Can you get into that? So, you know, at, at six, six and a half years old, um, you know, your brain doesn't have the capacity to understand economic situation and you know, opportunity. So that conversation happened much later on. Um, you know, and, and basically long story short is at the, at the time when my father left, there was a change of regime so communism ended and uh, you know the 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 whole government was a uh, as is in most eastern european countries in the 90s is just a for lack of a better word a big mess 
and there's no stability, there's no uncertainty. So, you know, my dad looked at this and said, if I'm to raise kids um, and give them opportunities that I didn't have, um, this is not the platform. I'm going to uh, take a chance and I'm going to immigrate. This is not a country that will give equal opportunity, um, you know, to my children. So with communism, it's always... You know, everybody's equal, but some are more equal than others. So he didn't subscribe to that mentality in that channel, and uh, he decided, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna look for a better life for me and my family." And he left. Tough decision. Um, you know, two kids, a uh, young wife, um, no, no real financial backing. You know, took all the money that um, that he had saved up and um, bought an airplane ticket and 120 US dollars in his pocket and uh, came through a couple of African countries and ended up in Joburg, ended up in South Africa for uh, a good opportunity for himself, his family and his children. So much later on was I able to process why he did what he did. At the time, I was very confused, you know, where did this guy go? You know, until yesterday he was here, now he's gone. My mom tells me, you know, he's in another country, Africa, is he catching lions? What's the story there? What's, why Africa? Why is he not here? But, uh, you know, at the same time, you're playing with kids and, you know, you're having fun and you're just being a small boy. So, but later on, definitely, and it made sense. And I'm very proud of him uh, for, you know, making a tough decision like that. That's, and bearing in mind, coming to a country where he doesn't understand the culture or the language and not really having any funds to support himself for the longest time. So, yeah. Knowing him and who he is and the competitor that he is, the, the, the fact that, you know, he always says, I don't have a reverse gear. There's no going back. There's no, um, you know, I can't do this. There's no, this is not achievable. It, it just doesn't exist. I've never, ever heard him say something can't be done. And, you know, from a perspective of a economic climate where, you, you know, it, it literally can't be done because if you outwork and, um, you know, out improve your competitor or, or the guy next to you or the guy that you're competing with at work, the chances of you getting promoted or getting, you, you know, climbing up either a corporate ladder or a business ladder in a communistic type of a regime is zero. Unless you have the right surname, unless you are connected with the people on top that can push you, it doesn't matter how good you are, it doesn't matter how hard you work, it, it's irrelevant. It's just, it's a different type of of, I think, a different type of system. And, and, and that's why, in my opinion, it's a failing system. And um, that's why he seeked a more capitalistic environment where if you work hard and you are consistent and you improve and you get better and you add more value into the market, you know, the market will see it and reward you uh, for that. So, so it's very hard to compete in a marketplace where the rules are not, um, you know, not favorable to people that want to grow. If you're content and you're not ambitious, which it definitely is very ambitious, then you know it's okay. But uh, if you've got a good appetite for risk and you want to go for it, that's definitely a you know, communistic environment is not the, the place to be. So you know, I, I fully understand now and uh, the world of respect for him um, you know, taking that leap of faith and, and, um, and you know, doing what he did. Wow, that's a very, very tough decision that um, your father you know, had to make at that stage. Okay, now my next question. How do you feel about abandoning your family, moving away from everything that you've known and coming to South Africa? How do you feel about that? So initially, you know, dad and mom have a, have a very nice way of selling something to me. So, you know, dad said, you know, we're going to an exciting new place. And, uh, you know, there's all sorts of wild animals. I love animals. You could see lions, you could see zebras, you can see elephants, you can see leopards. I always wanted to see crocodiles. He says, he says, you know, there's everything is in Africa. So he sells me this big dream and I'm, you know, out of the airplane, I'm excited. I tell my granny and all my cousins, you know, I'm going to go and run around with lions and I'm going to be, I'm going to be so happy. And, um, we end up in Joburg and there's this big concrete jungle with, uh, with no lions, but just a beautiful mix of 11 languages, all different cultures, different smells, different, um, you know, different 
even the traffic you sit on the you know at that stage at the wrong side of the car everybody drives you know in the wrong direction so i'm very confused i said to to my dad where's the tigers the lions you know you 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 sold me like a couple of days ago and said relax i'll take you then eventually did take us to see some crocodiles and lions but you know leaving everything behind at an early age is easy um it's it's you don't have um you know those close-knit bonds with your with your friends at eight you know everybody's a friend and your ability to create new friends at that age is a lot easier than if you are 18 for example because you look at life differently there's all sorts of other factors but at that age leaving everything behind was very exciting you know i'm i'm, I'm looking forward to a new adventure and uh, you know big ups to my parents for selling it that way you know they never sold it as we're leaving this behind for something better we just we're just going on a massive adventure to africa and and uh, we're gonna have some fun and uh, i like having fun so that that sounded like a good deal to me i can see how that made an impact in your life and who you are today you know initially you're processing two things as an immigrant so number one you're processing um, you know what i've left behind and uh, number two you're processing uh, what i uh, you know, what I'm going to welcome in my life. So, you, you know, as much as it's tough at, at that stage, it's not tough because you, you're more focusing on, now I can't speak English, so I can't understand anybody. They put me in a school where, you know, the schooling system is different. The questions are being asked in English. So I first need to learn English. So, you know, again, very, 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 very high EQ on, on mom and dad to make me realize that you need to now take this thing, which is new, and make the best of it. So I think you're more focused on the new rather than the old at that age. Now I've spoken to many immigrants that have um, you know, immigrated later on, and it's a tougher transition. But at eight years old, yeah, I want to play soccer. There's a thing called cricket at school. I don't know how to play, but it looks like fun throwing, you know, hitting stuff with a bat. Man, you're just a boy, you're having fun swimming, you know, it's it's awesome so rather than you know viewing it as a loss i'm viewing it as a gain what am i going to learn because there's so many different you know everyone looks different in bulgaria that you're all the same you know in the sense that the culture is the same you know there's no there's no um it's 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 all eastern european people you know they're all white people now i've got Indian friends, I've got colored friends, and now, now they're opening their lunchbox. I'm experiencing Indian food for the first time. I'm experiencing, you know, chicken and biryani, you know, made in a way that I've never tasted before. Oh man, I'm having fun. I'm excited. This state, very exciting. Very tough, but very exciting. I can understand how that had a big role in how it shaped you and who you are today. Let's get into mom and your sister. Tell us about the roles that mom played in your upbringing as well as sister and how has that changed your course in who you are today so let's start with mom mom um you know warrior she you know she had a she had a much harder time um you know transitioning than we did because at her age she was already established i mean she had a career she had friends family that she had known and grew up with um, you know her entire life so so that transition is very much different to mine she's you know she's not as excited as I am everything is hard everything is uphill but she's very resilient and um, you know she taught me the big picture so you know instant gratification versus a long-term gratification so long-term gratification you know you're gonna have to be through some pain and make some new friends you know understand the culture understand your position in the community and what role you can serve. So, so that's mom, you, you know, allowing things to happen for you because there's a, you know, there's a, there's a rainbow at the end of the storm. Um, when it comes to sister, man, she's, you know, she's very playful. She's just a, a positive human. Um, you know, she's going into this I can't speak English in real time with me so you know at a young age we experiencing the same sort of things you know what happened today now this happened what happened with you this happened okay cool um, I remember a stage where um, you know we we are 
jumping over the fence in the school we probably two to three uh two to three weeks uh, in the country so i find her, i tell her come come with me we jump over the fence we run away from school we go home so my mom says well what are you doing here the school's not you know it's it's only like 10 o'clock so i said no look the guy's asking me these questions i don't know what to do so i, I just i just came home and why did you take your sister i don't know because I, th I thought I don't want to walk alone, so I just grabbed her. And, you know, she's she's always like my sidekick, but uh, you know, later on became a beautiful human and uh, um, yeah, just fantastic, positive. Uh, you know, always looking for the for the why we can rather than why we can't. Right, children. I understand you don't have children yet, but you now should the good Lord uh, bless you with kids one day, what would you like? your children to be like, what is important to you, uh, and what values and principles would you like to instill in, uh, in your kids? So yeah, hopefully that, that you know, happens for, for me and my wife one of these good days. Um, so for the longest time, um, I've been, you know, in my teens, 20s, and being surrounded with people that don't have kids. So, you know, it's, it's been a joy. But now in my 30s, uh, a lot of my close friends have children, one and two kids. And here's what my takeaway is. You know, kids should be allowed to be happy. Kids should be allowed to be kids. But also kids should be constantly tested and pushed in a way that, okay, for example, this kid is very creative and is very arty so encourage that while this kid is very competitive he likes to you know to compete against other kids encourage that because finding out ways to drive this child is going to be different to this child and you know should i have kids one day i, I would love the opportunity to um you, you know to to find out who is driven by what and how to properly support that in order for it to grow. In the sense that, here's what I mean. You have an academic child that, unless you stimulate that particular child in other areas as well, will only become book smart. And I think that's not enough. Whereas if you have a very sporty, very physical child, and you don't stimulate the book part, that's also not going to be enough. So how do you find the balance between being, um, you know, very book smart as well as very, if I may call it street smart, because I think that will develop a leader. You know, you need the soft skills as well as the hard skills. You can't only have one, you need both. And um, I would love to, you know, I'd love to have the opportunity. I think that's the ultimate test is how you raise your kids. And uh, you're only successful if your grandkids are successful, not the kids. So, you know, that's, you know, that's the part I'm looking forward to. Wow, that's a beautiful answer. And um, I wish that uh, you have so many children one day that they're running around all over the house and, you know, screaming and just being naughty. Um, I think, I think um, that will be a wonderful experience. Th thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. From your mouth to God's ears. Now... Give me one value or one mindset that you wish you had, you know, acquired a long time ago that you could perhaps have used to a, maybe a quicker outcome to, um, you know, realization of how important that value or that mindset is. Do you have one? And if you do, what is it? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's undoubtedly reading or, um, you know, the ability to extract information from an expert in that specific field. So if you are looking at the field of accounting, you go and, for example, accounting, you go and, um, you know, you visit Take A Lot and you see the, or Amazon, I like using Amazon because then I can buy an audible book. What are the top five books on accounting? Um, you go and look at the reviews, you go and look at how many times they were rated, how many uh, stars they have out of five, you buy the top five books on accounting. And guess what? The average book is between four and six hours. Um, so 24 hours worth of listening gets you so much further along in accounting literacy than, uh, 
you know, I'll, I'll, I'll even say even a, you know, a year or two worth of online courses on accounting does because you get to learn from experts in that field. Leave accounting, sales. If you want to get better at sales, there's five or six books that if you go and dive into them and make notes and re-listen to them, you will be not an expert because it takes experience to learn the field and go into the history and go into the finer details, but you will be 400% better at sales after reading those five books. So absolutely reading, reading, consuming information about that specific subject, whatever it is that you are trying to improve in, whether it's like we shared, accounting, sales, anything. Just top five books, download them on Audible, on Kindle, whatever you like, buy them from Take A Lot and consume that information, make notes and um, you will definitely be further along than you were before you read the books. I loved your answer and, you know, for the viewers out there, I, I think maybe just rewind a couple of minutes and and listen to listen to that again because it's so, so important to not only, you know, focus on learning, but focus on learning, you know, things that you actually like, enjoy and can, you know, use in your day-to-day life. But, you know, putting that aside, you were never formally educated. You didn't go to university and, you know, there's no two-year, four-year degree. Um, You say you're a street guy. You're more of a street guy. So how can a street guy, um, you, you know, maintain a level of leadership in a growing company without that solid formal four or six year education that uh, normally entrepreneurs go through uh, to be able to push a company forward. So here, here's what a street guy is to me. First of all, a street guy is a person that grew up amongst different economic backgrounds, amongst people with different ideas of what success in life is. So for example, in high school, um, hanging out with what's considered gangsters, hanging out with people that are breaking, you know, breaking the rules, that are naughty, that are pushing the boundaries, that are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. So that's teaching me at a very young age, in my teens, that's teaching me what to look out for, um, you know, how the system works how the guys that are doing things that are wrong are looking at the system to break it and obviously not get caught. Um, That's teaching me that. So later on in life, I'm designing a process or a procedure and I'm already, as soon as a process is launched, I'm trying to break it because what would that certain friend that, you know, I was homies with at 16 or 17 years old, how would he break the system to cheat the system? So, in terms of a street guy, is you you you're not only associating yourself with people that are in, you know, we're gonna we're gonna get the best grades and we're gonna go and uh, study at Tuckies or w- whichever other university. I'm I'm looking at guys breaking the rules, you know, taking shortcuts, enriching themselves, not worried about anything else. Okay, so that teaches you how to, so that teaches you how to find a way to break a process or a procedure, okay? What else is a street guy? street guy is looking at something and deciding, okay, this doesn't work for me. This is not, this is not good enough. The way this is currently set up is not favorable to me. How can I change it to be favorable to me and my people? You know, that, that, that in business is very, very important because if you look at our our motor industry it's been you know it's been run for the longest time the same way you, you know you've got a you've got a enriched dealer principal or a uh, you know owner that drives profits only up to him there's no there's no real wealth created for anybody else except that person so how do we change that how can i get you know better quality humans better quality managers that are willing to wage the war you know in the marketplace with me but enrich them you know the same way that that you know that 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 certain individual that dealer principal is being enriched so how who do you get to do that you get street guys you 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 can't you know in my opinion and no offense to anybody if i offend you i'm sorry but you can't have an accountant um, who's never ever you know 
led people or, or, or understands uh, poverty, understands a person coming out of a, a challenged background. You know, you can't have an accountant get that person, you know, to work twice as hard as his peer. So what I mean by that is a person coming out of poverty, you will do a lot more to run away from poverty than you will do, you know, to run towards a good life. So now here's a kid, here's a kid that had a rough, grew up in a location, um, probably didn't have running water, um, you know, didn't have electricity for most of his life. Uh, but the kid's hungry, the kid is excited, the kid is, um, you, you know, in a situation where um, he can make some money for himself. So now you tell the kid that comes out of a good background that, listen, we, we actually work here from, from about 6.30 in the morning. And we don't stop until 8.30. The kid coming out of a good background, um, you know, doesn't subscribe to that channel normally. Sometimes they do, but normally they don't. And, and a street guy can go and have this conversation. Look, this is where you've come from. Um, you know, this is where I've come from. I've, I've herded sheep in the mountains in the winter in Bulgaria. This is how this industry has changed my life. Here's the five or six things that I've done consistently over the past you know, 10, 12 years, if you subscribe to these three habits, I guarantee you that your financial standing will exponentially grow. But I need you to put this input. So do you want to run away from whatever it is that you're coming from? Create a great life for yourself? Or, you know, are you comfortable where you are? Now, if you're not a street guy, you don't know how to have these conversations effectively because you don't know how to poke and drive people that in my opinion you know adversity coming out of a background where you've suffered will produce a lot more willpower to win than coming out of a background where you haven't you know 99 percent of the kids that came out of you know very good homes and good middle class income families you know they they had the right friends they went to the right colleges you know, they just can't compete against some of our killers here in the company because, you know, it takes a street guy to poke a street guy, you know, to go and wage war and take over the world. Wow, I really enjoyed uh, your answer and it's so relevant in terms of what happens today and um, the way that one can get information and at the speed that information can be received and deployed. Now, you mentioned earlier that nothing happens without hard work. Um, Dad was very hard working. So give me a little bit more perspective in what he instilled in you and, you know, the work ethic part that you say you, you, you saw from a very young age from Dad. Can you maybe dive into it a little bit more? Yeah, so very simple. When I woke up, Dad went to work. He wasn't home. Both nights, by the time I went to bed, Dad was still traveling. He used to do roofs, he used to drive a truck and go and do roofs all, all over the country. At one stage, he uh, worked in Van der Bell Park and we stayed in Pretoria. So during the week, he stayed away. Uh, on weekends, he was present, very much present, but then always busy. He never sat still. So, you know, when I wake up, a man, you, you know, is gone. He provides for his family and no matter what, there's no conversations of, you know, this job is so tough. This is, you know, this is unfair. Or this is so hard. None of that you know, BS. Sorry, I'm getting excited. But, you, you know, there's no, oh man, you know, this is, it's ridiculous how, uh, you know, this manages, but no, that, that's BS. So as a man, you wake up and you go to work, you grind and you do whatever is necessary to support your family. Full stop. Everybody experiences hardship. Everybody experiences tough times. I mean, I remember a, a quick story where he was doing you know, he was doing a shopping center, I think it, it was in Nigeria, and he nearly died of malaria. And, um, you know, after a couple of days, he's very sick. Um, eventually, you know, the doctors find out what it is and, and you know, they bring him back. He, he said he was going. He, nobody knew about it. My mom never knew about it. You know, we never knew about it. He, he, he says, if you know about it or don't know about it, I'm in, I'm in Nigeria. I've got malaria. Can you help me? No, you can't. Uh, you, you know, I have to fight through this disease. And if I'm dead, you know, they're going to let you know. Why must I let you know? 
I'm going to fight through this disease. I'm going to beat this disease. And when I do, I'll tell you that, listen, malaria is not, it's not a pleasant thing. And uh, that's it. We move on. So, you know, the work ethic is when I woke up, dad was at work. And when I get to bed, dad was at work. On weekends, very present, very active. You know, during the day, he'll call, how's school, what's happening? You, you know, all that type of stuff. It, it's still there. But a man provides. There is no BS. A man provides. That's it. Now, what an amazing father figure and what a privilege it was to see that work ethic being, you know, deployed each and every day, no matter what. Um, um, it's, it's, it's very inspiring that you can achieve everything through hard work. Eventually, you figure out the rest, but the hard work is never to be discounted. That's the foundation. Now, I want to go back to um, young Bobby. When you first came into the country, what was it like the first couple of months, couple of years, or you know, at least the first couple of weeks, months, and then eventually into years? Was it difficult to process uh, since you couldn't speak English or Afrikaans or didn't understand the culture? Give us a little bit about that period of, of your life. Awesome. So first week. So corporal or corporate rather punishment is not allowed in Europe at that stage. So that, that I don't understand. So we get into an Afrikaans school, uh, English school, but an Afrikaans class. And I'll never forget her. Her name is Yefra Fossi. And she used to have a big wooden ruler called Hot Stuff. And now at this, st at this stage of the, of the game, she's probably asking me about my work, my homework. So I don't know what she's saying. But, uh, you know, quite an evil woman. So she, she says, okay, no problem. You haven't done your homework. So she divides the kids that haven't done their homework. I'm obviously one. I don't know what homework I must do in Afrikaans class. I can't speak English. So I don't understand the story. I think it's the second day in that school. And she starts beating these children. But she's got this smile on her face. I'm like, what an evil bitch. She likes, like, these kids. And now I'm up next. So I don't understand corporal pie. So, so, but she whacks me, but so hard. I'm like, wait a minute. Why is this woman even beating me? So day one, I'm like, maybe I've done something wrong. I can't. The problem when you don't understand English is you can't ask anybody. So I just said to, to my sister, you know, this, this evil bitch, had, she, she hit the living daylights out of me. I don't know why. She says, but what did you do? You must have done something. Said, Look, I don't know. Anyway, next day, same scenario. Asking me something. I know now I have to go on that side of the class. I said, no problem. Take a beating. I'm like, no, this is... Look, I don't mind the beatings. I just don't understand why she's beating me. So I get home. I said, mom, you have to go to the school and ask them something. She says, what must I ask them? So I said, this evil woman keeps beating me. And I pull my pants down. And my ass is black and blue. So my mom's like teary. He's like, who hit you? He says, no, this Afrikaans teacher, this teacher. Why? I said, I don't know. So get her. You, you know, my dad's working at that stage for a construction company. And um, the, the owner's name is Gino and his wife is Ina. Um, so get Ina to put me in the car. Now we go to the school. He says, listen, why are you beating the shit out of this child? Like, what is he doing so I can... I can communicate and, and ask him to stop. So it's homework. So she said, but he doesn't understand. So anyway, fun, fun story. But uh, uh, the beatings didn't stop. You know, as I learned how to speak English and Afrikaans, I still got beaten, but at least I knew why. So I, I earned, but th those first two beatings were for free. They were pasella. Like, Welcome to South Africa. Bah! With a big wooden, wooden ruler. Yeah, that was, that was tough. But um uh, you know, you quickly learn what to do and what not to do and how you fit in, uh, you know, in your new environment. But through sport, I always loved sport. I made tons of friends, um, you know, playing cricket one day. I can't see in my left eye because a ball whacked me in the eye. I woke up in the teacher's office and says, listen, you okay? I'm like, yes. I, it's like a half an hour later, where, where am I? So he said, no, you got hit. But uh, through sport, made tons of friends, beautiful relationships. Some of them, you know, I still... I still speak to today and uh, yeah, still have fun with some of my friends from primary school. It was cool. That's a nice point of view. Born in Bulgaria, raised in South Africa. So by the time you get to high school, you already understand the culture. You can speak the language and you know what's happening and who's who in the zoo. But tell me, who were you in high school? Who did you hang out with? What were your priorities?
in high school, very confused, but um, yeah, leaning more towards you know the naughty kids, the kids that um, you know that are comfortable breaking the rules. I'm subscribing to that channel. Very sporty. Um, didn't have the body to play rugby. Uh, you know, played soccer. Uh, got uh, Tux University acceptance at a very young age, at 16. Uh, but then also discovered smoking, drinking, partying, lots of partying, tons of partying. And, uh, but uh, was always able to find common ground with everybody. So the guys that were very smart and the guys that did well at school, they were my homies. You know, if I needed help with homework or anything like that, they were always there to help me. Uh, the sporty guys got along. But, uh, you know, if I have to hang out with people during break, it was... It was definitely the kids that are doing what they're not supposed to be doing. So the, you know, the rebels, the guys that are breaking the rules and after school hanging out with lots of dark and, and you know, sometimes wrong people. But very glad I did at that age because they're teaching me about what not to do at the same time, you know, while I'm seeing them do it. So, yeah, I think always wanted to find my space in the world. And was just testing out different, you know, different channels. Who do I subscribe to? But, you know, lean more towards the naughty kids. All right. So that's where the little bit of the street, um, you know, rubbed off on you. And you were quite naughty in high school. But how does the transition into car sales happen? You know, does it happen straight immediately after high school? Or, you know, do you take a year off? Or how does, it, how does that transition happen? So, so very, very... You know, it's a, it's a very, very, very quick transition. In, in Standard 9, I started working as a salesperson for a friend of my uh, father's dealership. And uh, immediately, I do very well. Um, you know, my first paycheck is, it's a ton of money. It's like 17 and a half thousand rand. Uh, in month one, I sell very, very, you know, very quickly. I sell a lot of cars. And, um, you, you know, I think it's at that moment you know, me and my wife spoke about it the other day. She, she, you know, after I came home from my first, second day from work, while I was still in high school, she knew that's what I'm going to do. I, I said to her, I spoke to this customer, and this is what he said, and this is what I said, and this is what he said, and this is what I said. Then we went for a test drive. You know where? He says, where? I said, to the bank, because that was the right car for him and his family. They transferred the money. They took the car home. The kids were happy. Everybody was happy. So immediately, you know, I fell in love the industry because um, you know the moment that I served a customer and this is you know perhaps a little bit selfish but I did it more for me than for them when I gave good service it felt good that I'm doing it rather than you know doing it for them so when a customer comes in I'm going to give you the best service that I possibly can because it makes me feel good whether you like it or not is irrelevant that's how my mind works but if I give you my best and you don't buy from me, I'm not going to lose sleep. If I give you my best and you buy from me, more power to you. But each and every time I'm going to improve so that I get that almost like a high, that drug injected into my, you know, into my being by, listen, I've given it my all. And whether we did a deal or not is irrelevant because it feels good to give a service of that level. So straight, standard nine, selling cars, boom, introduced to the industry. The guy worked for had a lot of bad habits as well, um, and eventually, you know, he went out of the industry, and and we took over that that property. First became his partner, and later on took over the property. But also very fortunate to be able to work for someone that that showed me exactly what not to do. So incredible salesperson, but uh, you know, he showed me don't drink. I don't drink alcohol because I saw what happens when you drink. Um, you know, I don't want to discuss him you know in a bad light he did a lot of good things for me uh, incredible salesperson one of the best um, that I've ever met but you know showing me what not to do was very very important at a young age in terms of I'm going to be a business person one day I'm going to lead a sales team and these are the three or four things that you mustn't do because it leads to a negative um, outcome okay so eventually you know Mitmak is born and uh, you've um, dated the same girl for the longest time, Vanessa. And uh, she's, you know, she's had the opportunity to grow with you in the company, in, uh, in your mindset. But, 
you know, you're pushing long hours, you're constantly on the phone, constantly busy on your computer, constantly doing something. How does the work-life balance occur in your home? And how do you manage um, that switch between, uh, you know, I'm on, I'm switched on at work and, you know, I'm at home now with my wife and it's, it's, it's time to be a husband and a CEO and a husband. How does that process work in your head? Okay, so work-life balance is different for everybody. So work-life balance for me is I'm happy. I'm happy at work and I'm happy at home. Whether the scales of spending time at work uh, supersede the time I spend at home or vice versa is not in accordance to balance. So here's what balance is for me. When I'm at work, I'm present at work and I'm actively chasing a goal, doing whatever it is that I want to achieve for the day. When I'm at home, I'm present at home. Okay, that's the first part. So when I'm at home, having a conversation with my wife, my phone is next to me and um, we are processing issues and my phone doesn't stop ringing. However, I'm going to tell her this is a one or this is a five or this is a three, whatever the number it is that I put on. I'm talking out the bedroom here, but this is how I do it. So a one through three she knows i take so if anybody you know that is very close to me there's a couple 10 15 numbers on my phone no matter what i'm doing when they find me i take the call i'll tell her this is for example my running mate vincent when vincent phones me i take the call how are you is everything okay when my mom phones me when my sister my dad and a couple of the branch managers okay so it's a one through three i take the call if it's something that's not urgent, there's other firefighters that can handle that situation. I don't take the call, I'll send them a message. If it's really urgent, they'll phone me back to back twice. So that's a rule that I've set. If you phone me back to back, I'll take your call because I know there's a situation and you've tried other avenues. Okay, that's that part. Work-life balance with my wife is a constant goal setting and a constant conversation. So what do I mean by that? When me and her sit down and plan the next year or 18 months, this is what we want to achieve. So at this amount of cars, I'm going to buy us a house of this price range. Okay, not below this amount of cars. So what does that mean? If, let's say, for example, the dealership is not doing 350, I'm not buying your house. Even though financially I can afford it, only at 350, I'm buying your house. So now all of a sudden, she becomes my biggest driver and motivator, how far are we from 350? We are 320, babe. We're right there. Why are you home so early? I need you to get to 350. So she becomes the person that's cheering me on and driving me to hit a goal at work in order for us to have a couple's goal. Now, she's also a career goal. She's, she's worked you know, 17 years for the same company, been promoted multiple times. She's received multiple awards. So so it's not like I married somebody that is not driven. So she pushes me as much as I push her. The other part of work-life balance is Sunday. Sunday, for the longest time, I worked seven days a week. In my teens, in my 20s, that was a non-negotiable for her for us to get married. So I'll marry you. This is a non-negotiable. Sunday is my day. So Sunday, I'm either climbing mountains with dogs. You know, I don't like climbing mountains, but that's what she likes. And that's what I give her. You know, eventually I learned to like it. So myself, her, and the two doggies climb a mountain. Or she bought plants I need to plant in the garden. Or we're hanging out by the pool watching movies. It's her day. So the moment she says, listen, I've got emails and stuff to do, then I'll tell her no problem. When she's doing that, I'm doing my stuff. Sunday, 4 o'clock. Every Sunday at 4 o'clock until about 7 o'clock is my time to prepare so whatever we've done in the morning and in the afternoon at four o'clock it's an unwritten rule at our household i go in my office and i start doing my newsletter my communication i do with the team my planning who i have to phone tomorrow who's who's got an issue with me who i have an issue with and i plan my day and at seven o'clock we recruit back we have supper and we have a conversation and we go to bed afterwards so work-life balance is having a common goal you know between the two of us having an individual goal for her that I help her and drive her with in achieving, having an individual goal for me. But most importantly, once we hit that common goal, we need to set a new one. Then your partner becomes your, your biggest fan and the motivator and the driver to push you uh, through the hours that you have to 
in order to achieve your goal. So that's work-life balance for me. It's, it's you know, having active conversations of what we want to achieve as a team and, um, you know, chasing it and setting new goals, constantly setting new goals. Marriage is hard, man. It's, 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 it's the hardest thing that a man or woman can do. And it's something that, you know, there's great books out there. Uh, Love and Respect is one, one that I really recommend. And um, it's one that somebody recommended at a time where I didn't know exactly how to approach my wife in certain areas. You know, it teaches you how to do that correctly. And, you know, open up and, and discuss needs. You know, this is not happening currently. We need to pay more attention to this. You know, have the conversation. Men are normally less vocal than women. But if an area is lacking, talk to her about it. It's, 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 it's a thing. I, I need us to do more of this. Have the conversation. And if you do, then you can meet middle ground. And, um, you know, then you'll have a, you'll have a partner that's, that's not just there. You know, you'll have a fan with, um, with uh, their names on your back and your name on their back cheering you on. Interesting point of view and... Hopefully, you know, a couple of our viewers will be able to take that info and deploy it into, into their daily lives and their relationships. And hopefully, um, you know, it will bring them closer together rather than drive them apart, especially when, you know, a young couple is very motivated and very hardworking and has limited time to spend with each other. But um, it can't be all roses and champagne. Um, how do you process a loss and what does it mean to you every time you know, the coin toss doesn't go your way. How do you process that? How do you view a setback? Okay, so a couple of things. I love losing. So here's why. Every time you lose, there's a lesson within the loss, no matter in what. When you lose a relationship, there's a lesson in that relationship loss. When you lose in business, when you lose a deal, when you lose a colleague. Um, now, the tougher it becomes, the bigger the lesson. So I've lost people that have been, you know, with me for six, eight, ten years. And it's a it's a very bitter pill to swallow. But I always look forward to the loss because whatever got me there will bring me insight so that the next time around that certain relationship or similar one is tested. I'm better equipped to handle it, either to hang on to that relationship or sometimes cut it off quicker than, you know, having it extend to that point. Now, when you lose, when you lose money in business, you know, a lot of people pull their hair out. A lot of people, you know, go and become negative and depressed. And, you know, how could I have missed this? You need to see it this way. You, in business, you are making thousands of decisions every day. You need to make the best decision with the most information at hand. So, you know, whether we have to buy a car or not buy a car at a certain stage. So for example, a certain brand is very scarce. And, uh, you know, I tell the buying team, go for gold. Every single one that appears on any platform, you go and buy. You have to bully your way into each and every single one, buy all of them. Sometimes that strategy pays off. We get 10, 12, 15 in two weeks of a certain brand. And, you know, they sell quickly and we make money. But of late, recently, a certain brand, you know, said, how's it? There's 5,000 in Durban. And uh, now we're stuck with close to 30 of these cars. That specific manufacturer is running deals with Prime Lease and so on and so on. So, you, you know, now I'm thinking, maybe I shouldn't have been this aggressive. But being this aggressive has helped me. 19 times so on the one that i lose you know i have to look further in the future and you know closer around the corner to make sure that it doesn't happen again so i i really love losing i love it a lot i look forward to a loss um, the big thing is i don't like making the same mistake twice i want to make new ones constantly and um, yeah not losing the lesson that's the important part so i can i can process the loss the financial loss whatever it is I just don't want to lose the lesson. So loss is a good thing. All right. Interesting point of view on how a loss or a defeat can actually be a good thing. And, and I like the fact that you said that um, you like losing. Very interesting. Nobody likes losing. But if you use that perspective, then I can understand why 
you don't hate it as much and potentially in the future can learn to to like it now the training academy i know you guys run a training academy at work tell us a bit more about it and uh you know what is your aim with the training academy what do you aim to achieve long term with it so it's a it's a really big passion of mine i i don't think we've grown it to the level that i would like but you know i'm still very very young and the team around me is very young but basically it boils down to i want to correct an injustice and here's the injustice in the past if you didn't come from the right family if you didn't study at the right schools if you didn't mix with a network that will open certain doors for you it was almost impossible to compete in the marketplace okay what i want to do with the training academy is give an opportunity to young people that subscribe to working very hard constantly looking forward to improving um you know reading books getting value and actually being brave enough to apply it and get those people to be able to in a very short period of time 6 12 18 months be able to sit amongst you know people that have gone to the right schools that have had the right um you know formal education have mixed with the right crowds and um you know sit very proudly keep their chin up you know their shoulders up high and be able to say listen i not only belong here in this room in terms of income you know i'm whipping most of your asses here without having the luxury of having the right surname and so on and so on so that's the justice i want to correct how it works is very simple it's a tough tough place to be we take underprivileged kids and kids that um, come from rough backgrounds and some that come from great backgrounds but fit the profile you know that that street guy profile that i like the guys that like to be challenged and um, you know are not scared to go and um, say okay you 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 say i can't but let me show you i can so what we do then is we employ them for 3 months um where the first month you do a lot of theory so we've divided it into three primary school high school and tertiary education primary school is the basics the systems the processes the procedures you know how do you from basic things like fill out a fuel slip how do you fill out a order form for a road with it for a decra to how do you request a pdi pre delivery inspection all the way to business applications and so on after a month you write an exam pass rate is 80% if you get 79% you kicked out of the program anything above 80 you welcome to stay for another 3 months then you become a cadet to an experienced sales person where you actually do what um, some people might say the dirty work but for me it's the foundational work the 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 if you think about washing dishes you've got the green side and the yellow side so the yellow side is you know for a quick wash the green side is what gets the grime out so for 3 months you do the green side so you do the running around the going picking up the car you know getting documents from a customer um you you know phoning and and liaising with if and i with workshop with decra with all the other suppliers and vendors making sure that the time targets are met for 3 months then you are constantly evaluated on couple of areas willingness ability to execute um i'm big on time do you come do you come to the training early do you leave late do you make all the necessary calls that sort of stuff then after 3 months you have another test of uh, handling objections more technical stuff if you pass that and the manager votes you in you become a c player then you actively sell cars then uh, promote yourself to a b and an a player so your income can grow exponentially we've had multiple success stories where guys from our wash bay have come up and 13x their income within a period of about 6 to 9 months very proud of it i want to grow it even faster um and uh, that's definitely going to be a focus area for me and uh, for my team to make sure that we expand um very quickly in a controlled way where the culture is created you know from a very young age and injected into our company amazing i think you know young people should be given an opportunity and um if they bring the work ethic and meet you halfway they should definitely um you know explore the opportunity in the automotive industry it's changed 
your life and has changed uh, the lives of many, many people in, in our country. So tell me, what is it that motivates and feeds you? Because when training people, you have to give them a strategy, you have to give them motivation. But who or what motivates and what feeds you? Tell us a bit about you know, that process. So a couple of things. When it comes to being a competitor, there's a movie that I, I've probably seen a couple of hundred times. And it just speaks to me. The movie is probably one of the best business movies you'll ever watch in your life. If you see it from my point of view, a lot of, you know, a lot of people don't. But here's my point of view on, on when it comes to competing in the marketplace. The movie is called 300. The first one, the best one, the original one. Here's why. The baby gets born into a family. That baby is trained by being very tough on that baby, on that young child, very, very tough. It doesn't matter if it is the king's son or it is the son of somebody that's, for example, making weapons within that village. That baby gets extremely well-trained. Okay, that's our training academy. Then the baby has to face a demon. In the, in the movie, it's a tiger. The baby has to face the tiger, which is the marketplace. Okay. So we love all the new recruits that um, end up as C players. Okay. However, and I've made this mistake many, many times. And unfortunately, it's cost me. But every time I watch the movie, it reignites that competitor in me. That baby gets tested against the tiger, which is the market. If you don't hit your targets within the first, second, third month, we have to cut you. That way, only the bravest and best and most skilled remain in our country, which is Mutmak Town. That way, those that remain can serve our customers in a level that is very hard to compete with, and it creates a culture where either you fit in or you don't fit in. So, you know, when it comes to sales, that fires me up. When it comes to my faith, um, I've, I've heard this, I think it's on the Ed My Lead podcast, and it made sense. So he speaks of temperature. My temperature, for example, in my faith is, let's say, out of 100, sometimes it's 75, sometimes it drops below 75. But if I feel it dropping below 60, for example, I'll call a person by the name of Quentin, who's very very, very warm when it comes to faith, but also a street guy. So what do I mean by a street guy? He, he is, he's the first one to say that nobody walks on water and nobody's perfect. And he flukes now and then, and he uses a foul word because I do as well. You know, in the motor industry, sometimes, you know, the language is just a descriptive uh, language rather than, uh, you know, foul language. But, you know, that aside, he will then raise my temperature when it comes to faith very quickly. I'll tell him, listen, I'm processing this. I don't know what to make out of it. I'm losing my way a little bit. Then you'll tell me a Bible story. You'll say, this is what happened. This is when it happened. This is how, this is why. So immediately, boom, my temperature is rising with faith. So I've got a person for every single area. For example, if, you know, if I do very well financially one month and um, you know, I start getting scared, you know, how am I going to match that? How am I going to better that? I've got somebody that's way ahead of me in terms of finance. I'm privileged to speak to once or twice a month. I'll say, listen, I've done this. I'm scared. How can I even come close to it again? And then we'll process. He'll say, okay, what did you do right? What did you do wrong? Where's your leaks? Boom, my temperature rises again there. Same with marriage. You know, I can't go and seek counsel with some of my friends that have been divorced three or four times. We can have fun. And, you know, have a bra and laugh about the good old days. But I can't ask them about marriage because they don't have moral authority. I can go and speak to my parents, for example. who have been married for many, many years. I can speak to a friend of mine, Uncle Chico. He's been married for many years. What do you think here? What do you think here? So I look for people in an area of my life that have moral authority over that. But having said that, the guy that's the money guy is not the marriage guy. The marriage guy is not always the money guy. And the faith guy is not always the marriage guy. So you need to identify, I do, 
an area of my life where I need help and I'll seek counsel from the person that has got moral authority there in that area. It's not necessarily one person for four or five things. Normally it's one or two things. If I'm very hot-headed, I go to Vince and I say to him, this is what I want to do and this is exactly how I'm going to do it and I'm very vocal and graphical. He says, that's a great idea, but have you thought of this? And then, boom, he gives me a different perspective, calms me down and then I become level-headed again. So temperature in terms of being level-headed rises and doing irrational things, you know, falls away. So each area has a person and I go straight to that person when in need. They're my red button. And that's what fires me up and that's what helps me get through most days. Interesting perspective. Thank you. And who influenced you the most in life? Who was the one or two people that have influenced you to, um, to view the world the way you do today? Okay, so, sure, a couple of things. I... I like to get new perspective daily. Here's what I mean by that. Whatever drove me last month is not necessarily driving me this month because, you know, a favorite quote that I've heard somewhere is technology has never been this fast and it will never be this slow again. So I'm constantly, constantly looking for the next person that will help me with the next thing. So what do I mean by that? It's not like, okay, I've gotten the value out of you, you are no more useful to me. No, here's what I mean. When I go and look at a business person, for example, I'm going to say, okay, this business person has built a, let's say, a billion dollar company. I'm going to examine him. What does he do well? What does he do very well? What are the two or three things that I can incorporate from him into the way that I do things? and into the way the business does things. Okay, these are the five things. Okay, execute on those. All right, what doesn't he do well? He doesn't do these four areas well. Okay, I can improve on those. Boom, 100%. I've taken out of this person, I can move on. Now, the next person, what do I admire? What can I compare this person to that person with and take out from here, take out from here and constantly improve? So that's, that's the way I view you know, people that shape me. My family, my very close-knit friends are the people that I trust the most, that are my base, that if I'm lost, I'll go and speak to. But there's not one or two individuals that I look up to and watch their every move and make sure that I do. I'll take a lot from, from one person for six months. I'll study that person so closely. I'll be like, wow, what a monster, what a beast. You know, I love the way he or she does this one thing. Study, 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 become you know, better at it as close as I can to them and then move on. Because not that there's a next best thing, it's just a different perspective constantly because times change, technology changes, speed of doing things changes, but the family and very close-knit friends, that's my base. That's where I go to, to you know, feel safe and there's a few people, you know, in my life that I can, you know, easily pick up my feet and put them on the table and not worry about whatever I say, and if a if bomb comes out, it's okay, I'm myself. So, so very few of those, but uh, constantly looking, what can I get from an individual that sparks an interest or a individual that's killing it in an area of their life. So a shout out to the people that have helped you through your journey. And I want to touch on um, the channel a, a little bit. So it's supposed to be a business channel. It's supposed to be entrepreneurial and uh, tactics and it's supposed to give you a life hack or a different sort of strategy when you approach sales. But you interview um, MMA fighters, you interview Disney, Walt Disney, um, you know, marketing uh, people, you interviewed uh, CEOs of companies, you've interviewed rock bands. That, that, you know, outside of the CEOs that you've interviewed, that's not really business content why are you interviewing mma fighters and what is it about them that you are drawn to and what value can they add on a business channel just process that with me a little bit very simply put myself and the team so it's not only me who decides you know these are the people that we're going to interview myself and the team only speak to interesting people that we are interested in so 
somebody having a following or somebody being a celeb is not necessarily somebody that myself or the team want to speak to. So let's take MMA fight, fighters, for example. The Mott Pena, he's, you know, he, he's probably one of my one of my favorite interviews because I'm expecting a guy that practices murder all day, but what I'm what I'm trying to get out of him is you know daily habits, fitness. Um, what does he eat? How does he look after his body? How does he train? What are his rituals? What are the one or two things that we can get out of him in terms of health and wellness and looking? I mean, he's probably got three or four, five percent body fat. He looks like Superman. Okay, so I'm trying to extract that because i'm going through a transformation so let's you know let's see what he does and um, maybe we can incorporate some of that value into the team and into the subscribers then he sits on this couch and he's one of the most intelligent people that i've ever met he's very calm he's very collected he's very humble he's read a bunch of books he knows a lot about everything off-camera discussions are even more interesting than the on-camera discussions you know, he teaches me about resilience, you know, in a way that we've had, you, you know, people in the army that, that have gone to battle and have fought terrorists. You know, they haven't taught me resilience like he has. Lost his father at a very young age. You know, him and his mom tracking through Africa, ending up in South Africa here because they were, you know, in, a, in, a, in the middle of a war. So that young man teaches me resilience. When I wanted him to teach me techniques on how to eat properly and look after my my health for example then you know we have we have hip-hop artists that teach me about family so you know we had a couple of big names uh, we had a couple of uh, guys like Lofi we had Jack Barrow we had Francois Van Koch and um, you know I want to learn about how do they control their mood before the event you know that's that's my main key takeaway what do you say to yourself as Francois van Kook before you walk up on stage where there's 30, 40, 50, 60, 70,000 people screaming your name? How do you prep for that? You know, that's what I want to get out, number one. Number two, how do you go home and fall asleep after 70,000 people screaming at you for two and a half hours, you know, including me? Because I've been to a couple of their concerts. I'm a huge fan and he's just an ultimate performer. But then he goes and teaches me about discipline. He goes and teaches me about... Here's what happened to my life when I stopped drinking. These are the five things that I, I incorporated in my life. These are the six things that changed. And this is why I love my life today. You know, Jack Parrow <clears throat> teaches me about, you know, an area of my life that I didn't ever think, you know, I would speak to him about off camera. So we talk to people that are interesting to us because as South Africans, we've got beautiful stories to tell. Um, it's not necessarily the guys that you, you know that are that are selling as number one artists or, or the guys that are going overseas or captains of of teams. You know we've got phenomenal South African stories that are unique that have to be heard and that are very interesting and informative. So each and every, you know, I'll be honest with you, I haven't enjoyed all the interviews. There's some interviews that I've done that didn't move me at all. Um, you know, some of them that that I felt. You know, this was different. I expected you to be to be a certain way and you came out, you know, you entered this room here and you were a different way. So I didn't enjoy them. But I think if you watch some of the interviews, you'll, you'll pick up which ones I enjoyed. But nevertheless, even the ones I didn't enjoy have taught us something. So each one brings a different perspective and a different point of view, even if I don't agree with them. There's been a few that I didn't agree with that when they left, I'm like, wow, like I really didn't agree with you. Uh, I know you were going to get confrontational if I carried on poking you, but you know I didn't agree with you. But still, they teach us something, a different perspective. So I enjoyed all of them, or at least most of them. Awesome. I understand and it makes sense. Uh, you know, diving into your head a little bit, as weird as it is. And uh, thank you for spending some time with me. And uh, please continue spending some time with me because we are one. And uh, have a beautiful day. And thank you very much. Take care, everybody, and goodbye.